Uh, well, thanks for all of you coming out. Uh, the traffic was kind of bad to get out here, at least for me, because uh, I live on the east side. Uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, the Pacifica Institute for hosting uh, this evening and all of you for coming out. Um, because it's fairly, it's a small gathering, I want to keep it informal. I want to uh, give uh, a little sense of what I'm working on right now, which is what I was asked to uh, do, um, and, um, and really make it a little bit more conversational than a um, uh, full-blown uh, lecture. Um, as the Vice President um, uh, introduced, uh, I, I, I do have a background in, in, in both Japanese studies and Buddhist studies, and uh, I, I'm uh, very fortunate right now to be chairing the uh, School of Religion at, at USC. Um, I, I wasn't raised here in California. Uh, I, I lived in Japan for the first part of my life and then on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, it was always a kind of dream to kind of get to L.A. and, and uh, in terms of the study of religion, understand that uh, it is one of the most religiously diverse uh, cities uh, really in the world. Uh, so it's a great moment to be chairing uh, my religious studies department, uh, and I'm getting to teach right now a course uh, with a colleague uh, called Religions of L.A., and it's, it's, it's about the history and uh, uh, diversity of, of uh, all of the different religious traditions in Los Angeles. Um, but within that context, the, what, I, what I focus on and study and am and, 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 uh, and most uh, personally connected to is uh, the Japanese-American experience and the ja uh, Japanese Buddhist uh, tradition, um, and it, it, it's it's not the largest religious group in LA, but it is one with a history of about a hundred some years. Uh, Japanese Buddhists have been uh, in Los Angeles for a little over a hundred years, and in in places like Hawaii for uh, even longer. Uh, so one of the things I thought, um, in terms, of, I was talking to Ilker, and uh, we were talking about maybe what what, what could I could I could say tonight that would be uh, of interest to a diverse group of people, including people who that may come from uh, the Muslim tradition and other uh, traditions of that of um, uh, from Turkey and el uh, from elsewhere in the world. And it occurred to me that uh, maybe I could say a few words about the Japanese American experience um, in the United States, the acculturation process. Uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what happened during World War II. Um, it's a book project, uh, that theme is a book project I'm writing, uh, but it's also something that I, I often think about as a lesson from the past that may help us uh, understand our current polarity, polarity of religion uh, as well. Um, I say this because it's always occurred to me that if you really study and look back at American, American religious life, American religious history, there have been two major kind of tensions or two major positions in American thought about the place of religion in, Amer in America. On the one hand, uh, both uh, around the time of uh, the founders, uh, as well as quite frankly, even in our uh, civil discourse and debates today, uh, there is a point of view that says uh, America is foundationally or fundamentally a Christian nation. And that's one uh, uh, historical and, and, quite frankly, also contemporary point of view uh, that some people hold that says uh, even if there is some diversity, uh, America is fundamentally a Christian nation. So that's one point of view. And then there's another point of view that says America is a free nation a nation of religious uh, freedom. And so that's another point of view, uh, one which, which suggests that from its very foundations, um, from Jefferson on, um, there has been a tradition in the United States of uh, creating space for the free expression and practice of religion. And that uh, that's an old discourse as well as a current one as well. And so, in many ways, American religious history unfolds with different traditions like Buddhism, like Judaism, like in, in some sense, in early, you know, different ways of Christian traditions in, in, in the United States, uh, folding into this dialogue about is America as a nation to be defined as a Christian nation or as a free nation. Now, as you can imagine, Japanese American Buddhists who have been here for over 100 years or so, 
Uh, now I go to my own Buddhist temple and see kids who are, they call, they call them rokusei. Uh, mm -hmm. Issei are the first generation, Nisei is second generation. Rokusei means the sixth generation. So they've been sixth generation Buddhists here in LA. And, 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 and for them, certainly, they don't think of America as a Christian nation. They think of America as a nation that includes them. Uh, they and their parents were born here, and their grandparents were born here, and their great grand you know, all of them who are, are, are a part of the American, uh, li uh, American life. And so uh, that's one of the uh, uh, starting points of the Buddhist experience, is, to, uh, is, is that uh, Buddhism is a minority religion, but one which uh, uh, believes that it accords with American values, and one that uh, has over time acculturated in many different ways to fit the American religious landscape. And so that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, is um, a few quick snapshots of time as we look back at Japanese American Buddhist history uh, to note some important uh, moments in, in that history where uh, Japanese American Buddhists are also trying to grapple with this question of how do we, how do we as a religion from Asia, uh, come to terms uh, with being in a new country like uh, America. Uh, one of the uh, stories that, to me, get at the heart of this is a story that comes from uh, the wife of my, uh, as President mentioned, I, I, I studied at Harvard, uh, my, my uh, main advisor, uh, my PhD advisor at Harvard, Masatoshi Nagatomi, his wife uh, told me this following story about uh, a few weeks, uh, what happened to her family after uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, I think many of you know that uh, in the days and weeks following Pearl Harbor, uh, the FBI had a list called the ABC list. It was a, it was a, it was a list of people that they had on their uh, roles that, uh, for whom uh, they would either arrest, if you were on the A list, uh, to be incarcerated, arrested, and apprehended and arrested, B, to be interrogated, and C, to be um, uh, monitored. And Buddhist priests, and then in the case of this little girl, at that time she was only 12 years old, her dad was on the B list because he was the uh, board president of the Madera Buddhist uh, temple up in Madera, California, Central Valley, uh, Madera, California. Uh, he was on the B list. Uh, uh, if you were a Buddhist priest, you were to be arrested right away. And the United States government at that time viewed Japanese American Buddhists as opposed to Japanese American Christians. They saw Buddhists as a threat to national security, as a enemy religion that needed to be controlled in case of what they thought would be uh, uh, fifth column elements. So people that uh, would be uh, of Japanese heritage who would help the invading uh, Japanese Imperial Army and Navy. So they arrested all the Buddhist priests, but then they would also interrogate the Buddhist uh, priests, uh, B Buddhist uh, leadership, lay leadership. And so her dad was one of these people. So they, they had a small temple out in Madeira where uh, a lot of Japanese Americans uh, were doing agriculture in the Central Valley. And so she uh, came home one day after a few weeks after Pearl Harbor and saw this scene. She walks in, sees her dad being beaten on the floor by some men in suits, and she peeks in the living room and sees her uh, mother sitting at the living room table with a shotgun to her head. It turns out her parents didn't speak very much English, and she's only 12 years old, but she needed to uh, quickly think on her feet and kind of use her bilingualism to, to, to communicate between what were FBI agents and her parents. As a course of bad luck. Her dad had just been out in the lettuce fields and they saw he, like, there's some rabbits or something. So he was like shooting at them. And when the FBI arrived, and that was a bad moment to be doing that because the FBI agents believed that the, he was, you know, attacking them. And so, so that, that, that's what caused the ruckus in the first place. And then uh, she was trying to explain to her parents who these people were and then also to the FBI agents that her parents are not trying to attack them. Um, the, the FBI said, a, agents said, we're going to come back in a couple of days uh, to, they, they had some more questions. They're going to come back in a few days to uh, uh, follow up. And at that time, her dad said, okay, go and put on the 
uh, bath tub. At that time, I guess they were using wood for their ba ba baths. So that was one of her chores, so she didn't think too much of it. Um, start up the bath fire, he asked. And but to her surprise, he would bring everything in the house that had made in Japan, or that had Japanese characters, Chinese characters on them. Um, everything that uh, had any connection to Japan, uh, he asked his daughter to burn them. And for her as a 12-year-old child, one of the most uh, uh, distressing things uh, that day wasn't those items, but her dad uh, had brought her entire, it's called Hinamatsuri Ningyo, they're these kind of girls' day little doll set in Japan, it's a traditional Japanese doll set, and then he made her burn all of those dolls as well. And the re reasoning he gave to her was that we have to prove to the American government that we're, we're, we may be Buddhists, but we're not, we're not uh, unloyal Americans. And that we're, 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 we're not going to... Uh, so he was like, this is our way of proving that. But then he had this pause and hesitation. Uh, and he had some items, and he just couldn't put them in the fire. And what he did was he asked his wife to get a, a tin box, uh, and then he got this backhoe and dug a hole in the, in the, near the garage, is a large tree, dug a hole there, and buried these few items uh, under this tree. And his daughter asked him, what are you not burning, or, you know, put, what, why, what are you burying that's so important? Because you just burnt my dolls, right? So she's like, what's more important than my dolls? Uh, and he explained to her that um, he, they had a bound copy of the Amida Kyo, which is a Japanese Buddhist scripture, uh, that was passed down from generation after generation, and he couldn't get himself to burn that. He also said that as president of the Buddhist uh, temple, uh, the board president, he had all the n minutes and notes of the temple from its founding, and it wasn't really his personal property to burn. So he puts all of this in this box, buries it. And to make a long story short, I think as many of you may know, 120,000 uh, persons of Japanese ancestry were uh, put behind barbed wire uh, in different kind of camps during 10 different main camps and some other minor ones uh, run by the War Relocation Authority, 10 of them. Um, and uh, they were given between a week and 10 days to pack up uh, what they could carry, so usually a suitcase or uh, something, suitcase and a little something, because um, that's all they were allowed to take to these camps. Um, many families, like the Kimura family, this, this girl's family, um, had to sell their farms, or if you were living in L.A., maybe sell your business, or it's at um, you know, prices far below what the market value uh, would have been, uh, just because you had, to, you had to sell everything you had and then uh, store somewhere, and oftentimes at the Buddhist temple or the Christian church in the Javanese American community, uh, that which you could not carry, because all you could take was one suitcase. So they, this family did the same thing, and to make a long story short, they come back after the war. Uh, the people that had sold it to, though, were asking for the market value of the, of the farm. And of course, they hadn't made any money during the war, and the market value was 20 times what they had sold it for. So they couldn't buy their farm back. And this family came down to L.A. to be with their relatives, uh, but only after the dad was like, we have to find that box. We've got to find that box with that, you know, those valuable documents. But during the war, the new owners had torn down the garage and also the large tree next to it, and some other things as well. And, uh, you know, that whole X marks the spot. He, he had lost where it would be. And so, try as he might, he couldn't find it. So, to me, this story is symbolic of a couple different things. But number one, uh, somewhere in the soil of California are some Buddhist scriptures and Buddhist history, temple history, still buried. Um, and it's buried because for this family, this Japanese-American family, to acculturate, this is the theme of today's topic, but to, to, to fit into America, uh, they were willing to burn away their Japanese-ness, the things that symbolically uh, linked to Japan. But they weren't willing to burn away or to uh, uh, release their, their faith. 
uh, their Buddhist faith. And so this is one family story. There's 120,000 people, so there are many more stories of people who struggled, whether it's in that period or I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment, other periods uh, where uh, they're struggling with, how can I be both a Buddhist and an American at the same time? This is their big challenge. And so the framework of America as a religiously free nation allows and affords them the opportunity to think that there is a place for Buddhists or people of minority religion in America, but they come up against all uh, sorts of challenges uh, in this hundred some year history. Now, how do I move this forward? Is it? You want like a change forward? Okay. So I'm just going to go through these slides real quick. One of the things that some people don't know is that among the 2,403 people who died on that fatal day in, in, and on December 7, 1941, on uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, were uh, Japanese Americans. Right? So uh, including, I, I name at the very top, this little girl, 11-year-old girl, uh, they were in a, Buddhist temples often had these, what they called Dharma schools. It's kind of like Sunday schools for kids. Uh, but uh, uh, this 11-year-old girl was singing some, some Japanese folk songs, and then uh, the, the bombing be began, and some stray uh, bombs hit the Buddhist temple children's uh, uh, building, and, and this 11-year-old girl died. Uh, other people, uh, also a uh, uh, member of the, another Buddhist uh, temple, and his drugstore was hit and died uh, as well. Um, so one of the things that, about Hawaii at that time was that uh, it, was an, it was an American territory. It's not yet a state, right? It doesn't become a state until after the war. But it was an American territory that had a huge percentage of Buddhists. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, right before Pearl Harbor, uh, there, was, there was so much concern among American officials um, at that time that Hawaii was becoming majority um, Buddhist. Uh, in terms of its population, because the Japanese was, were the largest ethnic group living on the islands of Hawaii, uh, that uh, they were like, is Hawaii, uh, you know, America? So this is that, that very question I raised earlier. Is America a, a truly American territory when it's majority non-Christian? Right? And uh, in this period, uh, right before uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, Christian, uh, white Christian missionaries on the islands uh, talked about what they called the re-paganization of the islands. The re-paganization of the islands. Meaning, they thought that it was becoming a Christianized slash Americanized territory by converting native Hawaiians to Christianity. So the pa so-called pagan religion of the native Hawaiians was being civilized by becoming Christian. But then they, were, they called it the repaganization because all of these Buddhists came to the islands and they were having kids and the second generation Japanese Americans were also primarily Buddhists as you can see from this uh, chart on, uh, in there. 75% uh, of the population in the first generation, 80%. Second generation, 67.8% of the population are, are Buddhists. And, and you can, uh, there are about 326 Buddhist temples at that point in 1941. There are more today uh, around the United States, but that's how many there were uh, at, at that point in American history. Okay. Let's go forward. Uh, I think I've touched on some of these. This is a very quick picture to show you all the different camps. Uh, here in California, last Saturday, I went to the, uh, to the Manzanar camp out in, uh, it's east of here, uh, three and a half hours or so, uh, but up on the uh, northern bit, uh, called Tula Lake Camp. Uh, there's one, another one in California, right on the uh, California-Oregon border. Uh, Manzanar, uh, at its, uh, at its uh, peak, uh, held a little over uh, 10,000 Japanese and Japanese-Americans. And uh, Tula Lake, uh, uh, at one point, held about 18,000 Japanese-Japanese-Americans. And one of the things that I always get so uh, curious about whenever I go to Manzanar, uh, it's one of the 10 big camps, uh, is that there's a section there called the Manzanar Children's Village. And this is what always kind of makes me reflect on 
how unconstitutional or how um, uh, illogical the whole so-called internment of Japanese Americans uh, and that whole process was. Because not only did uh, no adult ever be, uh, no, no Japanese American was ever uh, convicted of espionage or uh, subversion uh, of, of, of the American um, uh, nation at that time. Uh, but, but the Manzanar Children's Village there uh, held uh, uh, dozens of these children who were picked up from orphanages starting in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, L.A., two, two, two different orphanages here in L.A., kids ranging from six months to six years old to nine years old, they were all rounded up out of these orphanages, and they were like, well, it's too difficult to send them to different camps. Let's concentrate them in one camp. And so they sent them to Manzanar, uh, California, uh, to that camp. And behind barbed wire uh, in this one secure area were these little, some babies and little children uh, put in camp. And it always made me wonder, like, what possible threat to national security uh, these little children could have had. But that was the mentality of the time. Uh, Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Um, they were worried about a Japanese Imperial Navy invasion of, 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 of California. And so they created a line. It's called the Western Defense Command Zone uh, line that you can see kind of cuts through, uh, cuts through uh, the western coast, Pacific coast of the United States. And any Japanese American living to the west of that had to go through that process I mentioned earlier. They're given a notice, you have between a week and 10 days to pack up, and you're in one of these camps to the east of that. And you can see some of them go as far east as Rower and Jerome, Arkansas. Um, I don't know how, how many of you know the name George Takei? He played Sulu on, 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 on Star Trek. He, you know, he was born and raised, not born and raised, he, he, was, he was a little kid growing up in Rower. Uh, for part of the time, and then a little later, his family was transferred to Tula Lake up in the northern. So uh, uh, I, I was with him, and uh, there was a, a meeting with uh, President Clinton when he, this is a time, you know, he was uh, governor of Arkansas, uh, in, and we were, there was this moment when there was the 60th anniversary of these camps when the, for the first time, many of these people, including George Takei and others, uh, went back for the first time uh, to see where they had been in camp uh, all those many years ago. And uh, today, there are some, uh, uh, then President Clinton made some uh, federal government money available to, to uh, make an interpreter center and make it a park ranger uh, site to, 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 to note uh, what had happened in Arkansas. But that happened in Idaho, in Wyoming, in, in, in Utah, and of course in California as well. So uh, Japanese Americans, were incarcerated in this way, and as I mentioned, Japanese American Buddhists were targeted first. So uh, there's an order by the President Executive Order 9066 in February 1942, some months after Pearl Harbor, uh, that incarcerates all of these people living on the West Coast. But uh, prior to that, uh, there had been these uh, roundup of hundreds and hundreds of uh, community leaders, and one of the main categories of being a community leader were, were Japanese American Buddhist priests. If I go to the next thing. Let's go to the next one. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, I'm going to say a word about this. So, one of the Buddhist priests incarcerated in that early period had been moved from California. He was, a, he was a Buddhist, a head of the head Buddhist priest at the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Buddhist Temple. And he was taken to uh, one camp and then uh, ended up in uh, another one. Earlier, there was another one in, in, in uh, New Mexico. And then he was taken across uh, Oklahoma and eventually out, out, out to the East Coast. And he used this phrase, I, 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 I know the family, and he has this uh, diary entry in which he says, I don't mind being moved to all of these det detention centers because I practice my Buddhism uh, within these the confines of, the, of barbed wire. And the Buddha prophesied, and he's referring to a, a sermon that the Buddha gave just before his death, that prophesied, it's called Bukkyo Tozen, Bukkyo Tozen, the eastward movement of, of Buddhism. Uh, Bukkyo means Buddhism, and to, to means east, and Zen means to advance. 
And he, pr- he predicted that the Dharma, or the Buddha's teachings, would, after his death, move eastward. It's just a small prediction, pro- prophecy he made. And so, for this man, who was in these camps during World War II, in his mind, usually Japanese Buddhists, when they talk about Bukyotozen, what they mean is that the religion begins in India. And has a series of acculturations along the way before it even gets to Japan. Because it goes from India into Tibet, India into South Asia, India into China, then Korea, and then finally to Japan um, in the 6th and 7th centuries uh, of the Common Era. So uh, it's already had a thousand some years of history prior to ever getting to Japan. So some Buddhists in Japan uh, talked about the eastward transmission of the Buddhist teachings finally to Japan in that very early period uh, of Japanese Buddhist life. But in this period, in the 20th century, sometimes Japanese Buddhist priests doing their missionary work in Hawaii or in California would talk about the Dharma moving further eastward. And finally this guy, this Buddhist priest who in these American detention centers, high school detention centers, would talk about like, oh, he's moving the Dharma f- even further east and, and, and simply fulfilling uh, the prophecy of the Buddha. So one of the things that I found very curious about many Japanese Americans in, who were incarcerated in these situations was they try to make the best uh, of their circumstance uh, without complaining, without uh, just try to make the best of it. And if I could get to the next one, please. Next one. By the way, this, this is a very quick slide. That's uh, in, uh, if you go down on First Street, the Khoyasan Buddhist Temple, that's, that's the old Khoyasan there. Those two on the left are uh, not from LA, but from uh, uh, Hawaii. But let me go to the next one. And some more things. Uh, it, it, let's skip these. Uh, and I'll come back to some of this later. But let's, let's go and, and to get to the picture of the beads there. It's a little hard to see, but on the bottom left side, I don't know if you can see, that's a, it's called an ojuzu or a Buddhist uh, rosary. Looks like a little circle with it, you know. And I was talking about this idea of making do with what you have and in your circumstance. Uh, That is a rosary made by um, a Buddhist priest who happened to be one of the highest security uh, detention centers in Crystal City, Texas. And he, they had a ration of one, one piece of fruit per week. And so at that time, I guess peaches were in season or something like that. So they got, he would keep the peach pit uh, every week and collected enough peach pits that he could make this kind of impromptu uh, rosary. Right. Uh, other people, you see down here um, that um, little wooden Buddhist shrine. Uh, it's called the Obutsudam. Buddhism, but in ja- Japanese Buddhism, not only do you go to the temple, but you may also uh, worship at home uh, with a Buddha uh, shrine at home, Buddha altar at home. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned, they had between only a week and ten days to get to these camps. Uh, I mean, get report, and then they were taken in, in, in buses and, and trains to these camps. And, and so, you know, for many families, they didn't know what to bring, and they had no idea where they're going and what kind of weather it would be, et cetera. The last thing they were thinking about is taking their Buddhist shrine with them. And so what they did was most of these places were in very inhospitable desert areas. All eight eight of the main ones are in very inhospitable desert areas. Two were in Arkansas in the swamps. But basically what they did was they took some desert wood and made that in the camp. Uh, And up there, that's from Heart Mountain, Wyoming, there was a pair of uh, carpenter brothers from San Jose uh, who, were, who had built the San Jose Buddhist Temple uh, who happened to be in that particular camp in Wyoming. And they took, uh, they had all of their friends get all this desert wood and they made this very grand, not just home altar, but a Buddhist altar uh, in Heart Mountain Camp. And that last photo over there is uh, Reverend Tansai's daughter. Uh, Basically, before they went to the main camps, usually they would be, like if you're in L.A., you, you'd be taken to the Santa Anita racetracks, and you spend the first uh, some time of your incarceration uh, in horse stalls, which were not that pleasant because they smelt and they weren't that pleasant. Um, in Portland, it was the Portland Livestock Exchange, and that was also basically horse stalls. And they placed these 
Japanese Americans initially in those places for uh, the number of months it took to build these larger camps that where they would take the entire community. And, but, you know, again, this idea of they may do what they, with what they could. So they had a horse stall, but they try to, you know, they had a few sheets and they try to do some things to make it look better. And I don't know if you can see in the middle there, there's some calligraphy, there's a scroll of calligraphy, then there's a little picture of the Buddha, and then there's an American flag. And for people like Reverend Tansai's daughter, they, she was born in Portland, Oregon, she's going to Portland High School. For her, she was an American, and yet she was a Buddhist. And that's the, that, that was this kind of moment where uh, they were trying to make the best they could, try not to uh, cause any problems, try to be, uh, make clear their loyalty to the United States, but they also wanted to, at the same time, uh, have their faith in Buddhism. Majority, most people in that period were Buddhists uh, among Jaivar, make sure that that faith was not compromised as well. Thank you. Uh, on, I don't know if anybody can read the Japanese, it's 1943, uh, August, 8, uh, August 15th, but it's uh, in, in Japanese uh, culture, uh, uh, B Buddhism is not only about spiritual teachings, but it's also about community gatherings, and it's also about um, uh, honoring your ancestors. And during uh, the month of August in Japan, they have a summer festival called Obon, uh, which is a, a festival to honor the ancestors. And in the year 1943, if you go to Manzanar today, you'll see it. There's this large concrete monument that says Ireto. And going back to that, my, my advisor at Harvard, his dad was in Manzanar. He was the only Buddhist priest in Manzanar. Uh, serving 10,000 people. But in uh, that winter of 1942, uh, after they'd been in the horse stalls and then taken to these camps in, in these uh, eastern desert areas, uh, a lot of the young babies didn't survive that first winter, and a lot of the very elderly didn't survive that first winter. And because Japanese people believe that, that it's called Nibon, the first Obon, or the first uh, uh, memorial service for somebody who has passed is a particularly, I mean, it's always important to think about the ancestors, but it's particularly important to, to make sure they are uh, remembered. Uh, the, he, he went around, this monument was, is built out of concrete, and it says on a ireto, the, the, the monument to honor the spirits of the dead. And he had gone around barrack by barrack uh, in, in this camp asking for 10 cents donation per family to buy the concrete necessary to build it. They built it uh, by the summer of 1943. And I have a, uh, 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 I went to National Archives in D.C. and uh, declassified some uh, documents from the, uh, f through the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, the, the official records, uh, basically there was surveillance within the camps on what the Buddhists were doing as well. And uh, uh, there's a, there's a uh, report about this event uh, which, uh, in which the camp authorities say 4,300 people, which is a huge number, uh, participated uh, in this nighttime uh, memorial service and, and, and mem remembrance and celebration, including called Obon, bon, bon dori, the Obon dancing. Uh, uh, 4,300 people had, 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 had participated in that. If I could move to the next slide. And this is the last slide I'm going to show, but uh, one of the most ironic things in all of this, in this, in this quest to find that, you know, that, that way of acculturating, that way of, of, of proving their loyalty to America, from within these camps on the mainland US and also uh, thousands and thousands of volunteers from the islands of Hawaii, uh, most of them who are Buddhists, uh, volunteered to serve, at that time the US military was still segregated, so you had all black units and whatever. They created an all-white, uh, all-Japanese-American um, unit to go and fight in Europe called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and, and the high islands of Hawaii, the 100th Battalion. And these two units combined and they became uh, not only in World War II history but in the entire history of the United States Army the most highly decorated unit of its size uh, of, of, of any unit recorded in uh, the Amer American military uh, history. Uh, they were dubbed during the war by the U.S. press as the so-called Purple Heart Battalion because so many of them uh, had received Purple Hearts and so many of them. Uh, and they were basically put in the front lines 
uh, uh, the Battle of Bruyers, uh, the, the God, breaking through the Gothic line, the famous saving of the Lost Battalion, which is this thing where they saved 200 some uh, white troops from Texas uh, and lost 800 troops of their own unit to do so. Uh, they, and uh, they were also involved in uh, the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp in Nazi Germany. And so this is the whole irony, right? They're fighting for their country. They're liberating Nazi concentration camps while their own parents and siblings are back behind barbed wire in the United States. So this is very ironic uh, situation. But it was through this that for the first time the American military uh, attached Buddhist chaplains in the military, um, created uh, what they called the B for Buddhism campaign. It, it, you know, the, it, at that time, military dog tags, you either had a uh, C for Catholic, P for Protestant, H for Hebrew, which, meaning Jewish, or an X. And uh, the vast majority of those who served uh, were Buddhists uh, uh, in this uh, all Japanese American unit, uh, both in Europe, and there's another 6,000 separate Japanese Americans that served in the Pacific as translators and, and, and code breakers and, and so on. And, 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 and uh, from within the camps, there's a campaign uh, in, in, uh, to, to, to ask Washington, D.C. To, to, to allow uh, the, the letter B for Buddhist on, 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 the, on the dog tags. So there's this very interesting moment in American history where there's a bunch of ironies going on, right? So you have these uh, people who are being put into, 120,000 people being put into camp, majority of whom are Buddhist. Uh, they are bearing it and trying to show their loyalty by cooperating as much as possible, uh, even though they've lost everything they've worked for for uh, their time in the United States. Uh, they have their uh, American-born children, especially the men, but they're also Japanese-American women who served in WAC and whatever other uh, 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 female units, but mainly men uh, the boys go and volunteer to serve both in Europe and in, and in the Pacific. And, uh, and they are basically uh, uh, spilling blood to, to earn their spot in, in, in the United States. And I conclude with this thing down at the bottom here. It says, Congressional Medal of Honor in Buddhism on the White House lawn. Um, uh, in the last year of Clinton, uh, <coughs> although the unit had uh, won unit citations, and had the highest military honors uh, accorded to it. Uh, and although many people have won the Purple Heart, uh, very many of the uh, 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 individuals involved in that unit had, would have been eligible for the Congressional Medal of Honor as well. And uh, it took until Clinton to kind of recognize that. And very interestingly, on the White House lawn uh, at the ceremony uh, to, commem to commemorate the awarding of that uh, uh, Medal of Honor to, to um, that unit, that American unit, uh, <clears throat> most of the people that the honorees were dead. And so they had a memorial service uh, done by Reverend Ho uh, Honda from the Washington, D.C. Buddhist Temple, uh, which is, if you can imagine, 60 years ago, Buddhism was a terrorist and subversive uh, threat to national security. Now you're having Buddhist priests on the White House lawn. So something's changed over that time, right? And, and not only that, uh, did Senator Dan Inouye, who I don't know, I think most of you know, a Democrat from Hawaii, passed away recently, uh, uh, a 442 uh, regimental combat team veteran. So I, I think most of you know he, he only had one arm. He lost that arm uh, being part of that unit. And he had served honorably in the, in the Senate, U.S. Senate, for a long time. Um, and, 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 and on the military side, Japanese Americans had been uh, uh, the enemy, and suddenly you have somebody like Eric Shinseki, at that time a general, today a uh, uh, Veterans Affairs um, member of the Obama cabinet. But, so things have changed. And uh, in the very last moment, I, let me just say that um, uh, just in the very last uh, uh, or recent history, uh, for the first time, Buddhists are in uh, the public sphere uh, as well, not just Japanese Americans generally. Uh, up until recently, most all Japanese American elected officials were Christian, 
it's kind of like the like the Indian community. You know, you have Bobby Jindal and uh, Nikki Singh and so on, uh, governors of Louisiana and and so on, who who um, are Indian of Indian heritage but are Christian. And it's only recently Tulsi Gabbard from Democrat from Hawaii, first Hindu in Congress. But two two election cycles ago, Maisie Hirono, Democrat from Hawaii, in the House, and Hank Johnson, Democrat from Georgia, in the House, and most recently. Uh, Maisie won the uh, Senate seat uh, in, 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 in the U.S. Senate, and so the first Buddhist to serve in the U.S. Senate. So all that to say, Buddhists are now much more than 60 years ago or so uh, in the public sphere, a part of the American fabric, uh, still, though, uh, needing to make the case that it's, it's possible, permissible, uh, and even maybe celebrated to be uh, both an American and a Buddhist. So let me end there and uh, open it up for your thoughts, questions, uh, comments. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And I was, as you were talking, I was wondering if that was something that was carried on in Buddhism as well. In, in the in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, I always like to think of Japanese culture as a very hybrid culture, mm -hmm. and so even Shinto is not really completely native. Mm -hmm. uh, the word kami, Shinto comes from ja two Japanese characters, kami no michi, mm -hmm. Shinto, and then. The word kami comes from the Ainu word kamui, uh, so it's, it, it, which is a meaning some, some awe-inspiring being. And so it comes from uh, Sakali, Sakalin Islands and, and, and Siberian shamanism. And it's a mixture of Sakali, that, that kind of northern shamanism with Ryukyuan and Polynesian animism. So there's a lot of uh, ideas that sacred springs and, and mountains are sacred, like the, the, that, that sacrality resides in, in the natural world. And then, and then what happens is, so that all mix, gets mixed up, and the Japanese people also are from mixed heritage. And then the continental people come uh, from Korea and, and China. And part of that coming of the continental people meant also the coming of, of, uh, of Buddhism. And that all mixes up. So then that gets mixed up in such a way that people are, can be multiple. So in, in Japan, there's already a long history of being multiply religiously affiliated, and that generally tends to define much of the Japanese religious culture. There are some exceptions to that, but uh, generally speaking, it's a very pluralistic, multiple religious culture. So they brought certainly that over to the US, mm -hmm. and in, Ho in the islands of Hawaii, uh, they, brought, they also emphasized Shintoism. And so Shinto priests were also, on, on the FBI ABC list, Shinto priests were also in the A category. And all across the islands of Hawaii, they were arrested. And, um, and those uh, Shinto shrines were shut down. One big difference was that in the camps, the United States government <coughs> thought Shintoism was even worse than Buddhism. right? And the reason for that was that early in the 20th century, uh, you could say even in the late 19th century, uh, there was a start of a rise of a movement called State Shinto, where uh, on the, uh, in, back in Japan, there was a kind of uh, uh, tie-in between the new imperial restoration and imperial power with the emperor and, and sh State Shinto and state-sponsored Shinto. And so uh, for American... Uh, intelligence agencies and officials, for, for them, Shinto was even more problematic than Buddhism. And so uh, in, the, in the camps, the 10 camps, you had uh, um, the, the United States government permitted the practice of Catholicism, Protestantism, and Buddhism, but not Shinto. Okay, so, because, so, so the consequence of that is that basically once World War II ends, Shinto becomes wiped out of the American, Japanese-American communal life. 
Uh, you can still go, there's an Izumo Taisha shrine in Honolulu. There, there's a couple of small shrines left, but it's basically wiped out of Japanese American life. Thank you. Yeah. What I understand is that there were so many Japanese people in Hawaii mm -hmm. that they didn't move them off to these camps. What kind of, but how did they keep them under control, so to speak? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, in, 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 um, uh, you know, there's 120,000 Japanese Americans living on the west coast of the United States, but there's 150,000 Japanese living on the islands of Hawaii. And they, pro they were such a big part of the labor force that if you somehow try to round up 150,000 and take them all to the mainland to these camps, that would have been, that would have devastated the Hawaiian economy. And quite frankly, they had a much more rational set of both military and uh, legislative leaders, as well as the police chief of Honolulu. There were other people that were much more clear-headed than the hysteria happening on the west coast of the U.S. And they recommended that uh, while martial law would be declared on the islands of Hawaii, and there was ways in which martial law, you know, circumscribed the lives of people, like there's a curfew after which you can't go out. Um, they actually, in on the islands of Hawaii, made a determination in terms of religion that uh, Buddhists were no longer eligible to assemble. Shintoists were no longer eligible to assemble. But if Japanese Americans wanted to show their loyalty to the United States, they should convert to Christianity because Christianity was, Christian churches were allowed to operate on Sunday. Okay. But Buddhist, church, Buddhist temples were not. Shinto shrines were not. And so that's a very important moment. That's, that's the religious valence on what martial law meant. So there was an imposition of martial law, but it's, uh, but it's also correct to say that um, the Hawaii situation was a lot better <laughs> in, in some cases, you know, in, in, in the main, than what's happening on the west coast of the United States or on the west coast of Canada. Canada's probably even worse than the U.S. Uh, on the west coast, everybody was uh, taken away and, and, the, and the state took away their properties. Okay? It wasn't just that they were selling it to private <coughs> seller to sell. The state took away their property. <clears throat> and, for, and, and they weren't allowed back on the West Coast for uh, many years uh, after the war. So, so in Canada, it's even worse. So Hawaii's better. Hawaii's a better situation. They weren't all incarcerated. Only their leaders were taken. And there's a, a small detention camp called Sand Island, another one called Honolulu and, uh, on, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Oahu. And they, some people stayed there, and others were stayed there for a time, then transferred to the mainland. Uh, camp, the, these camps uh, among the leadership of the Hawaiian uh, Japanese population, including the in, pretty much the entire leadership of the Buddhist and Shinto uh, clerics. So it wasn't just, it was, so it was the, not only the federal government, but it was a state decision as well? Uh, no, it, it, it's, uh, uh, when it's time of war, it's, 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 not, it's less a federal government and more the U.S. military. Uh -huh. So uh, with the Western uh, uh, defense Command Zone um, you, you, uh, is General DeWitt, and then General Emmons in Hawaii has a different opinion, uh, and he has because he has a different sets of people advising him, and and his advisors are telling him the Japanese Americans are not a threat and they don't need to be put behind barbed wire. Uh, this will we, we we know about this because there's a lot of Japanese Americans already in the National Guard and they've been very, they were uh, right there with us on on, on the day of Pearl Harbor. So, th so the, he's getting advice that says there's no need to put all these people in camp. There's a need to have a set of restrictions under martial law that he, he can declare as, as a, as a, and the provost uh, marshal's office can declare. But, but that's, not, that's not a federal government priority. It's, it's a military priority. Yeah? Um, how, how did the Hawaiian Hawaiian as a religion or a set of religious practices change among <coughs> Japanese Americans and among Japanese as they came to the United States. Very good question. Religions change, change right. in some way. So generally speaking, uh, when we talk about migrant religions moving from one cultural zone to another, uh, we talk about the acculturation process and we call we talk about the resistance to acculturation. And Buddhism experiences both. So on the acculturation side of the 
there's a whole list of things, but just to give you some uh, good examples, um, if you go down to Little Tokyo and go and see some of those Japanese American, historic Japanese American Buddhist temples that are all uh, about 100 years old or, or just about getting there, uh, one of the curious things I think you'll note is that you go inside, uh, maybe the outside looks like a temple, but as soon as you go inside, there are pews. And not only are there pews, there may be a little organ to the left-hand top. And one of the things that Japanese Americans did in their acculturation process was, number one, they became very congregationalist, meaning, just like Jews and, 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 and other people, uh, you know, the idea of kind of congregating, like, you know, in the early, now Jews meet on the Sabbath is Saturday, but there's, a point, there's an early point in New York where many Jews met on Sunday, just so that they could worship on the same day as the majority culture. Buddhists did not have a practice of meeting on Sundays in, back in Japan, but they started to do so. Not only that, did they, 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 they decided that they would try to take on the trappings of a church, including changing Buddhist singing t uh, styles called gathas uh, uh, into Buddhist hymns arranged with choral music. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, 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 and not only that, uh, right, especially right during the war, uh, in Topaz Camp, one of the camps in Utah, they made a, they made a decision that they would call their organization, the biggest denomination of Buddhism at that time was called the um, uh, BA, uh, Buddhist, uh, mission, BM, Buddhist Mission of North America, which is a Japanese Pure Land Buddhist school. But they called themselves the BMNA, Buddhist Mission of North America, and in uh, 1944 they made a uh, legal change, and they reincorporated the organization and called themselves the BCA, which is the names they still have, Buddhist Churches of America. So they somehow thought that if they use the word church, and they have pews, and they got some organ music, that's American, right? So, so that's the acculturation side of things. Today, uh, there are many people, including, for example, in that, that very tradition, who don't want to use the word church anymore. They were like, that was used, you know, to try to fit in, or whatever, and we're you know, a more, Buddhism is less, a th doesn't have to do that anymore. And so they like to call their institutions temples instead, uh, or get rid of the church music and replace it with traditional Japanese music. So this is a resistance assimilation or resistance of acculturation. And so I think these two things go hand in hand. And um, I think that's the way it kind of should be. Religions need to adapt to its local landscape, but at the same time, it needs to bring something uh, new innovative, uh, something to the table uh, to uh, enliven uh, any kind of religious landscape. So I see that I'm getting signals that time is up. So, I, but uh, that, that's a great question and we could talk about some, some more. Okay.